Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you're joining us from around the world to this latest installment of the, the Vitch Journalism Midweek Webinar Series. I'm Eric Olander, Managing Editor of the China Africa Project and co-host of the China in Africa podcast. Uh, before we get started with today's discussion, I want to extend a very big thank you to uh, Barry Van Wick and the team at the Africa China Reporting Project, as well as Anton Harbour and the folks at the Vitz Journalism School for pulling together this uh, seminar and the, and the great team that they've kind of brought together for our panelists on very short notice. So real just big kudos to you guys for doing this. Today, we're going to be looking and focusing on whether the COVID-19 outbreak and whether it's creating a media divide and how we as consumers and you as consumers can best navigate all the toxic mix and good quality information and the fake news and all of that mixed together at such an important time that we're all kind of enduring around the world as we deal with this pandemic. So before we get started, let me just kind of put a few dots on the chart, as I like to say, just to set up our discussion. The outbreak by itself is a huge, complicated story if there was nothing else going on. And even if that was just our story, the way that it would be covered in China, in Africa, in the West, in the US, in Europe would be totally different and distinct, even under the best of circumstances. Then throw in on top of that a lot of racially charged you know, content on social media coming out of Guangzhou, now coming out of the United States, uh, different issues in Africa as well. And that kind of brings up all these topics like discrimination and racism and things like that, all kind of thrown into the mix. On top of that, there's now this increasingly toxic narrative and this narrative duel that we're seeing between the United States and China that uh, Africans are desperately trying to stay out of, but at the end of the day, it is a new front in this emerging Cold War that's happening between the United States and China. And just on top of all of that, we'll sprinkle on a bunch of rumors, fake news, propaganda, misleading information. Uh, just today alone, in fact, on my Twitter feed, uh, there I debunked three is a fake news that kind of came out. So it's coming out fast and furious. And we're really excited that we have someone who does that for a living here today. So all of that together creates a very, very difficult situation for news consumers to figure out what's what at this time when we all need really good information. And we're going to also talk about the practice of journalism, of making this content, and then also for consumers and trying to understand the different points of view. And that's going to be the focus of our discussion today. And to help us do that, we've got an amazing group of panelists. And this is really something very special because this group coming together, again, on short notice, is, uh, is just very unique. And it's, uh, so it's really great. Let's first start and we'll go to Beijing, where we want to say hello to Professor Zhang Yancho, who's the Deputy Dean of the Institute of Community with Shared Future and Director of the Africa Communication Research Center at the Communication University of China in Beijing. A very good evening to you, Professor Zhang. Thank you very much, Eric. It's nice to meet you, meet you here. It's wonderful to see you again. Uh, and then we're gonna head now yes. all the way over to, uh, to Tennessee in the United States, where it's a very, very early start for Jeremy Goldcorn, who's the editor-in-chief of Sub China and host of the Seneca podcast. Uh, listen, if you're not familiar with who Jeremy is, then you're really not paying attention to what's going on in the China space. Jeremy's been kind of following China, consumed by China, we like to say, in involved in Chinese affairs, startups and all that, uh, dating back to the mid 90s. He's today editor of Sub China, which is an indispensable news resource uh, focused on all aspects of what's going on in China. And of course, with Kaiser Guo, he's the co-host of the Seneca podcast. A very good early morning to you, Jeremy. Good morning. Good morning, Eric. And hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. And then we're thrilled to be able to have uh, from Nigeria, Maiwa Tijani. Maiwa is a longtime business journalist. He was at The Cable, and now he's leading the AFP Facebook fact-checking drive uh, in Nigeria, where he's busy, of course, debunking a lot of the rumors and fake news. Uh, I've used a lot of his work, uh, what I do in the coverage of the China Africa Project, so I am honored and humbled to have you here today. Good afternoon, Maiwa. It's really nice to see you. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. I look forward to this discussion. I just want to start with a general question from each of you, just to kind of let's get the lay of the land before we dive into the specifics. And Professor Zhang, I'm going to talk with you to give us your assessment of how you evaluate the media coverage, particularly looking at from the Chinese side, but also sitting in Beijing, looking out at the rest of the world, and you follow what's happening in Africa. And just to give us a kind of an introduction to what your perspective is on 
the coverage, the quality of the coverage, and what's coming through and where we are today in this story. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Eric. And it sounds a very um, big question at the beginning. And uh, actually, um, our research team has been uh, monitoring the media, both the uh, African uh, media and also Western media on this uh, COVID-19 issues. And uh, we did a special report on the Guangzhou, ish, uh, Guangzhou incident. So we find that the, both the African media and also the Western media, they tend to uh, follow the uh, traditional way to do the reports on China, Africa, which means so when they report China, it's quite, um, quite negative as uh, it has been and the African media the same, especially on the uh, you know, Guangzhou issue. Um, the, we find there are some, um, the issue is not that simple, it's a complicated issue. But, um, you know, as to the, uh, the, 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 this meeting, this meeting is called, it's COVID-19 creating a media divide. I think I should, I would like to give an answer and, uh, for this and to, to answer your question. But actually, I don't think the COVID-19 create a media divide, but uh, it shows us the differences and similarities of the media between China, Africa, and even the West. So, um, but, this, but we, we, we have some challenges as, as well, which means um, not only the African media, but also Chinese media should reflect on what we should do. What is our responsibility? What is our priori uh, priority in re uh, reporting such you know, a crisis? So I think um, all the media, uh, I mean, the government are challenged by the social media. We know the social media, there are so many fake news and the post truths in, in fact, and uh, they are you know, the two emotional uh, you know, uh, footages. So it's quite challenging, uh, which means I think uh, I don't think they are much divided, but I, I would like to see we, we are facing a lot of challenges. Okay. Uh, Jeremy, let's get your take. You're somebody who sits and looks at Chinese news coverage all day, uh, as what you do at, the, at, at SubChina. Do you, what do you think of what Professor Zhang is saying and what's your outlook on the divide or the coverage and how it's perceived in the different parts of the world? I agree with Professor Zhang that COVID-19 didn't create the divide, uh, but it has exacerbated it. Um, and it has exacerbated and accelerated a lot of other trends, geopolitical trends, um, that we now see reflected in the media. Um, and of course, one of the biggest ones uh, of those is the deteriorating relationship between the United States and China. Um, so I, I, I don't think that we can blame COVID-19 for uh, the fact that we have different media narratives, but it has made it very obvious how extreme the differences are between ways of approaching reporting on, <laughs> on reality are. And uh, this is not to um, uh, insinuate that you know, the Chinese press is all propaganda and the American press is all free. Um, I, I think um, it has also shown up um, inadequacies in the Western press. And what I'm speaking of is um, the coverage of COVID-19, which started in January. I mean, I know I first wrote about it on January 4, uh, and that was about the time when it first began uh, being reported in English. And the Western press tended to treat the disease as a, a, a Chinese problem. Um, and a lot of the coverage was focused on the political aspect of the disease, not the healthcare, not, not the, 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 the scientific aspect of the disease. And I think one result of that was that much of the West was left unprepared for the fact that COVID-19 would come uh, come, come, uh, and find people out in Italy and you know in New York. Um, so I, I think that's one other aspect to bear in mind that COVID nineteen it sort of exposed some of the weaknesses uh, in in the press too. And I think certainly in the Western press, it exposed a certain attitude to reporting 
on disasters in China and other countries, you know, non-Western countries, I'll say, rather than developing countries, where we look at those problems and think that they are isolated problems and that they're not problems that are going to become global. Right. Uh, Mayoa, you're, you're sitting in a very interesting vantage point. One, you're in Nigeria, which is interesting, and we'll get to that. But two, you're following what's going on on social media. And let's remind everybody that Africa is a continent where the median age is 19.7 years old, a young continent. This is a continent where news consumption has changed radically over the years. And a lot of people, if not a majority, are getting their news from social media. So much in the China-Africa coverage now is playing out on Facebook, on WhatsApp groups, on Twitter, and other, and other places. Talk to us a little bit about how you see the coverage, both the fake news, but also the non-fake news that's come out in the past two months related to COVID-19, to what happened in Guangzhou, and to the current China-Africa discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, for, for Nigeria, the, re the reporting on COVID-19 started a little bit later than the rest of the world. Um, we started reporting it late January, early February. And um, the way it has played out in the country has been, of course, the first thing we saw was a, a, a surge in the amount of fake news that we get as related to health issues, health challenges. So people started, um, sharing what they considered as cure to the um, disease. And of course, they started sharing information from WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, a lot of misinformation here and there. But what has um, been a little more interesting with how it has been covered here in, um, in Nigeria is the fact that a lot of for Nigeria, the disease is not just um, a pandemic that is health related. For a country that is heavily dependent on oil, it is also an economic problem. And this is also affecting the media in many ways more than just reporting it. So uh, the existing mistrust between uh, the political class and then the people, and then of course, with the advent of fake news, there's also been some sort of some portion of that distrust cast on the media. So when the media is reporting a certain number of cases or something about um, coronavirus here and there, there's this um, is, is like we're challenging what is on there on social media, which may or may not be proven. So at this point in time, the set for credible information is challenged by this particular outbreak. Okay, Professor Zhang, Mayoa brought up the issue of trust and distrust. And I'm, I think we should just get right into it. Our time is limited today, so we're not going to kind, of, uh, uh, kind of waste time here. So one of the things that I've noticed in the coverage is it feels like Chinese and Africans are having two separate discussions, in part because in China, People can't see Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, all of the social media sites. And for example, all of the videos that came out of Guangzhou that riled up and continue to rile up people and to anger and frustrate people, people in China don't see. And so there's this disconnect that's going on in the discourse between what Chinese people who are seeing Weibo, Weixing, WeChat, and Chinese official media and that narrative, and then the narrative that we're seeing in Africa, which is something driven by social media, uh, which people just, they're talking past each other in many ways. Professor Zhang, I'd like to kind of hear your thoughts on this idea of people talking past one another. Okay. Uh, I think partly you are right. Uh, in China, we don't use those uh, so-called international uh, uh, social media, but uh, Chinese domestic social media are not consumed by the Africans. But that does not mean uh, there is no bridge between China and Africa. Actually, uh, both the Western media, Chinese international media, and African media, and a lot of um, uh, most of the media online could consume the by both sides. Uh, but the problem, I think, is um, how much we can trust the social media, because the social media, uh, some of the media, like uh, the Guangzhou, uh, you know, about the Guangzhou incident, and it's quite emotional and uh, without any sources. You cannot check where the source is, where is it from, and um, 
and even there's some fake news on the social media. So it's a, um, it's uh, it, it's you cannot uh, think a social media is that reliable. But at the same time, I think um, both you know um, uh, Chinese government and African government are facing the challenges how to regulate media and how to make a better use of social media. So uh, I don't think social, uh, you know, we, we are in the two different world, but, uh, you know, Guangzhou issue was uh, also um, highly discussed in China. So it's, it's not something uh, secret uh, the government tried to hide, but um, I think it's also a good opportunity for Chinese, uh, the people and also government to rethink about uh, those issues related to Africa, African history and the discrimination issues. Yes. Yeah, Jeremy, let me get your take on this as you know, you looked at, at these issues. So Professor Zhang says the gap isn't as wide as it's made out to seem. Uh, you look at this from the point of view in the United States, and I would say we have a similar issue in the United States where Chinese media and American media are often talking past each other, and Americans and Chinese don't always connect and understand one another. And I think the same, I mean, you're, you're South African, you follow this very closely. What's your take on terms of how journalists and the news media and social media have covered the issue in such a way in that people actually are using a common language or not? Yeah, it's difficult to see people using a common language now. I'm not sure if we're still talking about COVID-19 or uh, to the harassment of Africans in, in Guangzhou. Uh, but uh, in both cases, yeah, we're not talking a common language. I mean, China, of course, the big problem is that the government blocks most international media and all international social media, thus denying all but a small number of people the opportunity to even interact uh, with uh, uh, their global peers. In the United States, the problem is completely different. It's that most people are um, uh, consuming entertainment uh, and that the news has devolved into a, a kind of degraded infotainment, essentially. And, you know, Fox News is notoriously the worst and obviously, you know, uh, Trump supporting right wing and uh, full of racism. But, uh, you know, looking at CNN, uh, uh, it's, um, you don't get a very accurate picture of the whole world uh, from watching mainstream American media. You have to do the work of reading. Um, and most people aren't willing to do that. So, I mean, I, I think I disagree with Professor Zhang that the gap isn't as wide as we think it might be. I sometimes think it might be even wider than, yeah. than we think it might be. And uh, it's not just America, China. I mean, I think you're seeing the events in Guangzhou have revealed a similar issue uh, in Africa in the sense that, you know, for most young Africans, uh, reading about China for the first time, if they were in the last six months, what they would have seen is video clips of Africans being harassed, evicted, you know, turned out onto the streets uh, in Guangzhou, and that will be their impression. And although it was widely talked about in China, it wasn't uh, as widely talked about <laughs> as it was on African social media. That's right, that's right. Um, let's go to a question in Mayoa. I'm going to bring the question to you. Herman Wasserman, who is a, a well-known media scholar in South Africa, uh, we're going to pick up on what Jeremy was talking about and also what Professor Zhang in terms of these, these stereotypes and the misperceptions that, that come out. And Herman says, given the existing often contested relationship between Africa and China, do we see the COVID-19 crisis exacerbating stereotypes, biases in, about China in African media? And are there examples of misinformation, which is what you look for, that draw on these different stereotypes? So talk to us a little bit about misinformation and the stereotypes and how they're exacerbated or not in, uh, in African social media. Yes, yeah, since the outbreak, um, we've seen an increase of, you, you see just any random video of, um, okay, let me give an example. There was a fire outbreak here in, somewhere in southwest Nigeria, I one of popular markets. And the, the next day on social media, there were already videos that um, some people were burning Chinese shops in that particular market. Now, um, we also saw like some old videos from China 
where some, of course, Africans were being maltreated. And then he was trending on social media for like um, a week. And then there was another one of the Nigerian ambassador to China um, confronting some Chinese people on the role they were, how they were treating some particular citizens of Nigeria in China. So basically all of this has heightened the, um, has kind of affected the relationship basically between how we see the Chinese and maybe otherwise. So um, the case of course is getting worse as a result of this particular pandemic and of course the fake news that is coming into the picture here and there. And to make matters worse, so the particular example I gave about the markets that were set on fire, um, when we were trying to get the information to say um, Chinese shops were burnt or not, um, we contacted the police to get more information and they were like, uh, they cannot release any information on that, the investigations were still ongoing. So while investigations are still ongoing, people have taken that space, that vacuum to say that this is what is happening, this is what we feel about the Chinese and this is how we are going to deal with it. So I, I, I think that it's absolutely correct to say at this point that with the um, intervention of misinformation and of course with the videos that we've seen, even if they were from the past on social media, about how some Africans were treated in China, it creates a certain kind of stereotype, which would be very difficult to undo in the near future. So uh, Professor Zhang, let's kind of pick up on that because it really comes to this question of authenticity. And um, you know, Mike, who is a South Sudanese journalist, he has a question about, he says, how do we ensure that fake news is real news? Now, the the problem is with real news, it becomes very murky as to, well, whose definition of real news? So it goes back to, and I, again, I don't want to only spend time on the Guangzhou incident because the COVID-19 is much bigger than that. But whether we talk about the COVID-19 origin, that's a dispute and that's covered differently in different parts of the world, or we talk about what happened in Guangzhou. In Guangzhou, the Chinese media and the Chinese government was saying there's no racism and there's no discrimination in China. And that is the official policy. Zhao Lijian, the Chinese foreign ministry spokesman, repeated it. Ambassadors across the continent said, we want to assure you there's no racism, there's no discrimination against Africans or anybody in China. The problem is, is that people like Mayoa and others were looking at their social media feeds and seeing not fake videos, but legitimate videos, as Jeremy pointed out, of Africans being maltreated. It was, it was not fake, it was there. And so we have this disconnect. Then all of a sudden we get into this question of real news. And so how do we sort out as news consumers, the Chinese position that says there's no discrimination versus the videos that people see with their own eyes that show that things were happening? What's a consumer to do in your view? Uh, uh, I think that's a very good question. You know, for, for, for I, I, I do uh, media literacy studies. I think for my suggestions for the media users, especially the internet users, they should, you know, know they should understand the very the most fundamental thing is uh, media. If it is a single source, it's easy to be biased. I, I saw I, I watched a video from uh, the SABC, and uh, it's it's only interviewed the one student, one African student from Guangzhou on this issue. But it's a, it's, I would just say it's a, it's a single, it didn't interview any, any Chinese student, it didn't interview any Chinese African student in China, you know, any uh, other Chinese student in China. For example, student in my university, African student, they do enjoy their life during the COVID-19 and the, the university, I, I'm sure most of the Chinese university treat them very well like princess and prince. So. Um, there are a lot of uh, stories like that, but uh, unfortunately, those media didn't give uh, even one second to those pictures. So, which means uh, you cannot just blame the um, the media users to be, uh, you know, media literate or to be information literate. But at the same time, I, I think the media should also take the responsibility. They don't. They didn't provide the whole picture. I mean, the, the report is not very well balanced. Think about, you know, not only African people was uh, sort of uh, mistreated in China, 
and also in, in the United States. You think about Chinese people also mistreated in other countries, in the US, in some uh, European countries, in, in Africa as well. You think about people died in Zambia and the factories were burned in, uh, in the, I mean, in the, uh, Nigeria. So that's, uh, I mean, that's the common uh, problem faced by us. So you, part of that is, I think the media should take this part of the responsibility how to cover, how to provide more balanced report instead of just uh, pay attention to a single fact. A well, single fact. I, I will tell you, as somebody who, who reports on China Africa every day and does a podcast twice a week, um, I, I cannot get Chinese guests to appear on the show. It's pure and simple. <laughs> it used to be easier six months ago. Before six months ago, I could call up Chinese professors, scholars, you know, analysts, and they would say, sure, I'll come on and you can go through our archives and you can see it. In the past three to four months now, everybody says no. And uh, African I journalists complain that, about uh, the same didn't thing. Send, you didn't send an invitation to me. Oh, well, you're booked for next week, by the way. Uh, but, the, uh, but, but it is, a di and I get, I get comments from a lot of African journalists who say, Eric, can you help me uh, introduce me to a Chinese source, either at the embassy, either at a, a think tank, either someone else like that. And they universally say no. So one of the, what should an African journalist do if they want to interview you, a Chinese I official? I should tell you a different story. I have uh, our African journalists, uh, both from Nigeria and also uh, Senegal, to reach our embassy and to to interview our, you know, um, webinar on, on, on China-Africa relations. And uh, I think um, it depends how, who you reach and uh, how can you reach those people. Um, I know that my, you know, uh, the, my former students and the journalists, I know I help them to, to try to reach, you know, Chinese sources. Um, yeah. It really depends. You cannot draw that conclusion completely. But do you have any suggestions for African journalists? Because we have a lot of journalists in our audience today. And what tips and recommendations would you have if they want to interview? As you said, we want to have more balance in the coverage. How would yeah. someone like Mayoa at, at AFP or Jeremy at SubChina or somebody at SABC, what tips and practical, if they want to interview Chinese sources, what would you recommend they do? Uh, you, you know, I, uh, one is uh, if they like to have, uh, for example, those from TV, I, I think uh, if we reach Chinese media, Chinese media, uh, like CGTN, like uh, Xinhua, like, uh, you know, they, I think they are quite open to share their, you know, um, sources. And I know that CGTN, they have a CGT, they have a CCTV plus and they, they uh, share all the free footage worldwide it's it's a free to use all the footage and um, uh, they can reach the embassy they can reach you know the uh chinese uh i mean it's 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 interesting i uh you know even uh when those issues occurred i think um chinese part chinese part also like to reach the african local media i also suggest my government to try to you know speak on the local media and try to let the a local uh, African local uh, journalist to report on this. I even uh, submitted a proposal to invite to 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 the government to to invite African journalists back to uh, I mean to to do the interview after the COVID nineteen to Guangzhou to Wuhan to report on this to do the in uh, to do the field uh, investigation. So I I think we sh we we should uh, you know set up sort of uh, you know. Uh, um, framework to link the chi Chinese side and also African side. This is something, some work we should do, but I don't think there's no way for that. There's a lot of uh, possible, you know, uh, channels. Yeah. Uh, Franz Kruger, he asks a, uh, a question saying, why do I think that there's hesitance on the Chinese side? Um, I'll say that I think people are more concerned about saying something that will get them in trouble. I think that conditions now are very sensitive, particularly on issues related to US, China, geopolitics, economics. And I think, you know, a mid level analyst or scholar, not a big official like an ambassador, those guys, and they're, they, they know what they'll do, they'll be fine. But we're talking about a, a professor at Beijing University or an analyst at the Shanghai Institute of International Studies. You know, those mid, those normal run of the mill scholars who we interview every day 
in Washington or London or, or Johannesburg, I think that there's concern that they will uh, say something that will get them in trouble. And I think they're more hesitant. That's, that's the only thing I can think of. No, 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 that's not the truth. I think uh, even during okay. the Guangzhou incident, and we were uh, encouraged by the, our university, by our colleagues to speak up, to find more chances to speak up and to, to explain the issue to the African, general, uh, African media. Okay, Jeremy, let's get you to weigh in on this. You've been covering Chinese media for 30, I won't say it, I don't want to date you on that one, but you've been covering <laughs> Chinese media for a long time. Uh, uh, a shift or anything, or, uh, is, is, or do you see what Professor Zhang is saying, that things, they're trying to open up and be more expressive? Um, I... Huh. I, I have to disagree with Professor Jung <clears throat> that, uh, I mean, if the idea that things are as open as they ever were, um, I, I think there's no question that in, in China, since uh, Xi Jinping became um, top leader, uh, the environment for people speaking their mind has deteriorated pretty significantly. So, I mean, I, I, I see the question you're asking, the challenge of trying to get Chinese voices to go on the record or even off the record uh, for journalists um, is, is, is really, really difficult. Um, and, you know, I think that is one of the big problems China has in, in, in um, trying to tell its story to Africa and to other countries in a different way from the Western media or in a contrast from, for example, a lot of the stuff that's going on on African social media is because the, the voices that come through strongest, I mean, the, 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 the media presence in Africa, CGTN, the state TV, is a very powerful Chinese media presence in Africa. And there are some private players involved in television, but certainly in terms of news, I think CGTN is probably the most powerful. Um, and this presents the Chinese state view of matters. And while that might be a view and it might sometimes be correct, uh, there's a reason why CGTN fails globally to attract a significant audience is because the Chinese official point of view is extremely wooden uh, and extremely unappealing, generally speaking, and doesn't generally uh, speak to the concerns of local people. Um, and without uh, allowing uh, the noise of Chinese civil society to speak up for itself, I fear that in Africa and elsewhere, the voices we'll hear coming from China will primarily be the voice of the state. And as long as that continues, uh, it will be difficult for people in Africa and elsewhere to um, see that China is perhaps a more complex country than the stereotype would indicate. Okay, uh, sorry, my video froze there for a second. Mayoa, you've been listening to the discussion. You have heard two very different points of view uh, on the China-Africa relationship. I'd like you to weigh in on where do you kind of fall down on the spectrum between Professor Zhang uh, on one side who says that China is trying to reach out and to do more to engage African media. You were at the cable for a long time. Now you're doing fact checking. And then Jeremy, who says that in recent years, it's become more closed, more state-driven. CGTN messaging reflects the issues of the state, but not necessarily those of African civil society. Give us your take on, where, on, on, on this discussion between do, those two pillars. Um, I, I, think, I think I'm closer to Jeremy than the professor. Um, in my experience, of course, I've, I've had um, times where we needed to get some information out of China, and sometimes it's extremely difficult. Um, I, of course, I studied with some friends who came to study media practice in the UK from China. And so getting in touch with them to say, okay, I'd like you to speak about this, I'd like you to um, give me more information on this or that, more often than not, they cannot. In fact, for some of them, they prefer to move out to, say, Vietnam or, or come down to Africa to actually practice journalism. So I, I think that the Chinese media, of course, has like a 
so like a, a, a particular way they want you to see China and anything outside that you probably would hear it elsewhere away from China. So, okay, so let, let me give an example. When um, there was a time earlier this year where China, based on its particular study, was reported by um, one of the state media outlets that um, the chloroquine, chloroquine had shown some promise for treating COVID-19. Now, when we found that, we needed a few more, <coughs> a little more information about the whole process, the study and all that. And it was extremely difficult to get someone to speak publicly about all of that. So, and you know, in this particular situation where it has to do with health care, and of course in a country like Nigeria that chloroquine happens to be quite popular, there was a lot of conversation around that, but it was majorly African because we couldn't get enough voices to come in from the other side. So I, I feel like the way the relationship is, is if we are speaking about China in Africa, we do not get enough Chinese voices. And if we are speaking about Africa in China, we also do not get enough African voices. So the link is still not good enough. Yeah. What do you think, Maya, can be done? Let's get to some practical solutions. We've identified the problem but I'd like to see if we can get to some practical, productive solutions. Um, I, I think that a lot of what can be done has to start, a, a portion of it has to start with China. And mm -hmm. of course, if we are being um, truthful with ourselves, we would probably say that would not happen anytime soon. On the African side, what we can do and what we've been doing is trying as much as possible to put out as much facts as we have available to us. So if you say that um, this is happening in China, personally, we might not be able to get the voice from China to speak about a certain video or a certain incident. But using our own technical tools at AFP, we are okay. able to say, oh, this particular video was shot in 2016 and not 2020. So it has nothing to do with COVID-19 or this. So on our own side, we are just um, employing digital tools to be able to say, uh, we know that you have your opinions about China, but this is what we know the facts are. So if we can do that a lot more on the African side, I think that we can pass more, we can make people make informed choices, not just stereotypical op opinion about China. So for the Chinese media, it's going to take a lot more than using digital tools and all that. So it's going to be some um, easing, opening up diplomatic decisions and all that, which of course is beyond us at this side of the continent. Professor Zhang, one of the biggest challenges in the China-Africa media relationship is that two, uh, too few African journalists have a very solid understanding of China, its politics, its history, its economics, all of that. And the same is, reverse, is true in reverse. Uh, I was speaking with some journalists at a Shanghai publication and the editors, not the journalists, it's the editors who control what goes on to the homepage, where the journalists do things. Uh, their idea, they're very click driven in many of the, uh, of the bigger news sites. They want stories that are sensational. They want stories that are exciting. And if you're talking about the run-of-the-mill, everyday African story, for a normal Chinese news consumer, like a normal U.S. or even to some extent European news consumer, Africa is very far away. And at the end of the day, when we're talking about issues like COVID-19, uh, the knowledge is quite low. What do you think can be done in China to help improve the overall knowledge, especially for editors, to get them to better understand some of the issues going on in Africa today? Um, I think that's that's a very important question. Uh, it's 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 a very essential for both sides to understand each other. You know, let me give you one example. Uh, every year we have a couple of uh, you know African uh, journalists visiting us, and once I ask them, "Do you know Focock?" and they don't know, they never heard of that. So that really surprised surprised me. And African journalists, they they are already in China, but they never heard of uh, Focock. So, which means the really lack of knowledge about China-Africa cooperation, and it's the same. And uh, I think Chinese media, we still like we 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 like to you know uh, encourage more journalists 
and to be expert on China-Africa relation. So that's why uh, in recent years, and like Tsinghua University, we, um, we did a training every year to train our young and potential journalists to report on China-Africa. And by, um, uh, with a new approach, which means a more constructively and um, let them to focus on China, uh, Africa. So I think it's a challenge for both sides. Jeremy, as an African who has lived in China, now in the U.S., uh, you've kind of seen it from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, most people in the U.S. still see Africa as a place of war, famine, AIDS, child soldiers. Let's go through the list of stereotypes, uh, you know, safaris, you know, all of that. And there's been efforts to try and change that perception. China in many ways now following Wolf Warrior 2, and we're starting to see the iconography and the relationship align itself in much the same way that it has in the US and Europe for, for decades. Uh, what do you think as someone who's kind of, as an African living abroad in China and in the West, can, what can be done to help improve the quality of understanding on the part of Chinese journalists about Africa in your opinion? Or Africans about China in reverse? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's a, a difficult question. Uh, What's well, a good question. Um, and uh, I mean, if I had a, a magic wand, I think I would just move large groups of young people who are interested in journalism around the world, a thousand from China to various parts of Africa and vice versa. Um, you know, I think some of the most powerful um, uh, sort of uh, ways that uh, people in China have become informed about Africa have been, for example, a few years ago, there was a young Chinese guy compiling a Swahili Chinese dictionary and blogging about it on Chinese social media websites um, and gathering quite a following. And he, he was writing about uh, uh, East Africa, mostly Kenya, uh, as, as he saw it, uh, not this Wolf Warrior movie stereotype or the American media stereotype. Um, and I, that seems to me the most powerful thing is to have ordinary, you know, I think the big problem with us, particularly in the United States, but everywhere around the world, understanding other countries, is that the only thing that we really think of as news is bad news. Um, so, although, you know, if you're in America, you are exposed to good news and bad news all the time, the news that comes out of Africa is typically bad news. And the news that comes out of China, too, is typically, it's either, I mean, it's either China's bad or China's big or China's weird. I mean, those are the three stories you get about China in the American press, typically. It's scary, it's very, very big, or it's doing something weird. Africa, you tend to get um, something scary and horrible is going on. Um, and it's very difficult to break through the noise of the news um, with something that isn't just bad news. Um, so, you know, I think if there's anything that uh, governments or people can do is uh, to encourage more uh, citizen exchange and more, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but more social media, more citizen journalism. I see- Oh, no, no, don't hate to say that. We, we like social media. Um, uh, to, that, to that point, uh, I've just put in the chat for everybody, uh, yeah. a vlogger from, from South Africa, Fejo Moli, um, and this, I think, is, and I've, I've featured more and more of these young Chinese who are posting on YouTube, Instagram, for an international audience. And Molly is a really interesting example of what Jeremy's talking about. Number one, she talks about positive engagement. Uh, she talks about it. She is distinctly 100% Chinese. Uh, she's blogging and vlogging from across the continent. Uh, she lives in South Africa, but she travels everywhere. She talks about food and about culture. And she gives a very Chinese worldview, but at the same time in a very positive context. So if everybody's looking for what Jeremy's talking about, which is a counter narrative sometimes, something totally different, I really recommend we go to you check out uh, Feijo Moli. Uh, she's excellent. Um, okay, Professor Zhang, I'm gonna come back to you. Uh, we had a, a story, a question here by Vera, who says COVID-19 is a public health issue, but has heavy political and economic nuances. Who, in your opinion, do you think should write this story, political or health reporters? Um, 
I think, you know, for COVID-19, it, it is going on. Of course, we should put the health communication first. So the point is, uh, I don't think there are any, I don't think we, re we really lack of a uh, very good health uh, reporter, health, you know, communication reporter. But uh, so far, I think um, the report on COVID-19, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's more focused on the political communication instead of uh, health communication. So um, I think that's a problem. I, I would like to respond a little bit on the, um, on the uh, you know the 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 conversation just now, uh, uh, I think the problem between China, Chinese media, and African media is uh, we, we we have uh, especially Western the, the, there are a lot of um, you know bias against the Chinese media. So how to understand the media system? But we have a different media system. But that does not mean Chinese media system is something wrong if it is different from the West. So I okay, think can you do me a favor? Hold, hold on, Professor Zhang. Can you explain what is the, you say it's a different system. What is the difference so that people really understand what you're talking about? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the different system is uh, just like uh, Jeremy talked about, uh, the Western media, the so-called Western media, Western, uh, li more liberal media. Uh, the news is focused on bad news, negative. Okay, bad news is a good, uh, is a good news. And so that's why, you know, during the COVID-19, the, the uh, Guangzhou incident, it's all focused on the negative side. But what about the good story? What about the Chinese, the African student was uh, well treated in China? But no, no, no story, no report on those parts. So which means bad news is a good news. So that's not the whole picture. But in China, we, 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 I, I think I, I, I would like to promote constructive journalism. Maybe some professor, they disagree, but constructive journalism is a more balanced, it's, um, it's a it's a it's a solution focused. It's a it's focused on the future. So I think it's a, it's a good for us to rethink about a new approach to do the um, uh, you know uh, reports. Either it's a house communication or political communication. But I, I think it's uh, if the news is focused too much on the negativity, it's a, there's a no um, way out for us to get rid of uh, the you know stereotype or bias. Okay, but that's the Western media. We're not here to talk about the Western media. You study African media. Talk to us about the African media. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, last uh, December, I gave a lecture in Addis Abeba to uh, about 70 uh, journal local journalists there, and we do the journalism uh, training, and I introduced them the, um, the constructive journalism concept. I, they, they really, really like that concept and then they never heard of news could be done uh, in that way. So um, they set up, um, you know, uh, they like to set up association of uh, constructive journalism even. And uh, I think we, we should uh, learn at, at, at the beginning, I think we should learn from each other how we report instead of we just uh, close the door and to point it at the other. I, I, I don't think that's a wise. Okay, Mayoa, you've heard it there about constructive journalism, which is a more positive view of journalism. The U.S. European media, in Professor Zhang's view, is too negative. Uh, what's your take on what you've heard? Um, personally, I, I feel like um, virtually every region of the world, of course, is trying to, at this point in time, the world is looking for alternative sources of hope. And um, a lot of, in the West, in Africa, uh, people are trying to report or push stories that deliver hope to people at this point in time. Of course, uh, like it's always said, bad news sells, travels faster, and all that. So it would be there. But um, a, a new crop, maybe not even a necessarily a new crop of giants, but a lot of giants across the world are also focusing on uh, the good sides of global development, the good sides of COVID-19. I, I know that in Nigeria, a number of um, media outlets specifically focus on those who survived, tell, telling stories of survivors of COVID-19. Recently, a woman, and a, a, somebody way older than 80 survived in Lagos, and of course it was all over the media uh, pushing out the narrative that uh, a, lot, a lot more positive in information can come out of this particular crisis. And of course, the wake of 19 has hit the world. It's like everybody's business. The health reporter is going to have to report the health side of it. The economic reporter would report that. The sports reporter would speak about how it affects 
sports also. So I feel like um, while we might want to be constructive about it, there's also the need to report the situation as it is. And in some situations, it can be very negative. And at that point, it's best to just put it out there and let people know how, what the impact and effects of this particular disease can be. And so it helps to make informed decisions on how to handle the situation. So for example, in Nigeria, a number of media houses have started cutting down their staff strengths, uh, laying off, uh, cutting salaries as a result of the economic impact of COVID-19 on those media houses. So for that kind of media houses, you don't just, while they might want to do constructive reporting and all that, there's also an angle of telling the people that this is so bad that I lost, okay, so for someone who has lost his job and is trying to report about COVID-19, whilst being objective and everything, there's also the responsibility to say that this has immense negative consequence on the country and the economy at large. Okay, so we are coming to the end of our time, and I want to make sure that we, uh, we end on time. And so first of all, I want to apologize to everybody who submitted questions that we can't get to. Uh, if I'll, I'll go ahead and put my email address in the chat. If you'd like to send me some questions, then I'll pass them on to some of our panelists to see if they can answer some of them. Uh, but I do apologize, we've just run out of time. What I'd like to do before we go in the next two or three minutes is just have each of you give uh, a final kind of thought on how you see the COVID-19 coverage uh, and again, thinking about this in practical journalism ter terms, and simply because that's what our purpose here is today, about what you want to leave people in terms of the news. Uh, <clears throat> what we want to leave people with in terms of covering COVID-19. COVID that's right, that's right. Um, I mean, I, I would say the one thing I've learned uh, is that, uh, we should pay more attention to the healthcare aspects of any disease from any country than the po political aspects. I think that was a failure of global media uh, in reporting on COVID-19. Um, yeah. Okay, Professor Zhang, what, what do you wanna leave people with in terms of this discussion about how Chinese media, African media, whatever, how they cover it, uh, thinking in, in, in specifically about the journalists in our audience today? <clears throat> uh, since COVID-19 is the common challenge for us, I think we, we all should find solutions together. So um, I would suggest uh, it's, it's maybe it's for long term. We need uh, to reflect on the journalistic approach, journalistic philosophy and um, our, you know, um, media, uh, media, you know, the, the media's responsibility. What is the media's responsibility? Okay, and Maya, what uh, what's your final reflection? Um, my word to every journalist at this time is: we are living in a world where, like I said earlier, everyone is looking for alternative sources of hope. Um, if you find stories or angles of the COVID nineteen situation that are positive, that give that hope, you should tell it at this time. And of course, facts, facts, always, always at this time. The lives of people are dependent on the facts that they have, the information that they have. Information is power. The same way misinformation can be bad power. So put out the facts there, let people have to make the decisions themselves. Thank you for taking the time in the morning, the afternoon, the evening to join us. Uh, Jeremy, if people want to follow the work that you are doing at SubChina and on Seneca, and even to subscribe to the Seneca newsletter, what, what can they do? Where can they find you? Um, the easiest place is subchina.com, S-U-P-China.com. Okay, and then Thanks. you can listen to the podcast there, and I do recommend the daily newsletter that, uh, that Jeremy and his team are putting out on China. It's probably one of the most comprehensive newsletters uh, and it's not too long, it's not too short, it's kind of the Goldilocks newsletter, so I do, do recommend that. Mayoa, if people want to follow the work that you're doing and what you're reading and writing and they want to connect with you, what's the best way for them to get in touch? Um, I, I think the best way is to go to factcheck.afp.com. And of course, a number of people could follow me on Twitter. At, I'll, I'll drop my Twitter handle in the comment section. Okay. And I, I will say... It's related to 
Uh, that my wife and the fact AFP is doing is getting incorporated into my newsletter at ChinaAfricaProject.com and also in some of the coverage that we do. Um, and then Professor Zhang, I'm assuming that you're not on Twitter or Facebook or anything like that, but if people wanted to connect with you or to find out more about some of the work and research that you do, is there any way that they can get in touch with you? I think uh, uh, language is a really problem. Um, they can reach me through my, uh, you know, uh, email, and uh, I welcome all. You know, I, I like to help uh, African journalists to to reach the people they like to interview, and uh, I'm happy to, you know, to organize a similar web webinar maybe next month and to discuss further on these issues. Oh, that's wonderful! I recommend to all of our African journalists in the audience to take up Professor Zhang on that offer. Uh, those are not easy offers to come by these days, so I, I definitely recommend it. Uh, and then, uh, of course, if you'd like to follow me, I'm EO, and uh, and I cover China Africa issues every day. Uh, at the ChinaAfricaProject.com. So we'd love to hear from you. Uh, my email address is eric at ChinaAfricaProject.com and Cobus, my co-host is Cobus, C-O-B-U-S at ChinaAfricaProject.com. Please do get in touch. And if you have questions for either Mayoa, Professor Zhang or Jeremy, you can forward them to me and I will pass it on to them as well. So we are right at time. I wanna thank our guests. I wanna thank uh, Anton Harbour and Barry at, at Vitz. And then of course, wanna thank all of you who are watching online and in the chat and as part of this webinar in the midweek webinar series. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Have a great day.